Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. I have a fantastic guest for you today. My Southern California podcast sister, Susie Carter Singer, is here today. We're gonna, she's going to tell us the story about her mom and the treatment her mom had in long-term care and how that led her to creating the movie No Country for Old People, which we need to help support her to get it finished. So thanks for joining me, Susie. My pleasure. I'm just going to say, because I know I do that all the time. It's Susie Singer Carter. Singer Carter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, my my audience knows that your name could be Jane Smith, and I would figure out a way to butcher it. <laughs> <laughs> I am a very visual person. Yes. Um, you probably don't know, because this is not a visual medium per se, but I was a portrait photographer for almost 30 years. And names just have always been terrible for me. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's why, you know, it takes a village. And so, right, everybody has their thing. Um, yep. Yeah, well, thanks I, for having me. We finally got to do this. I think you were a guest on my show mm -hmm. what, last year or the year before. I'm trying um, to remember. 22, early 22. So like 18 months ago. Wow. I know early time flies. <laughs> so that was right in the throes of my mom's journey of our journey together last year so yeah that's when it all started um do you want me to just jump in and just yeah go ahead background? yeah so you know this the the documentary that we're working on right now no country for old people really started out of my discovery of the this broken system our our nursing home system really our our healthcare system in general in in is broken but Specifically, the nursing home long-term care part of the healthcare system is 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 just dilapidated, and it has been for fifty years, close to fifty years. I mean, I just finished reading a book called Tender Loving Greed, which is quoted all the time in in you know articles now, like as of last week. So that's it was written in seventy four. We're talking forty nine oh years ago, and in if. If I tell you that the same stories that this magnificent, you know, investigative writer wrote about are exactly what is happening today. And that is heartbreaking because things haven't changed. And even with, the, you know, the 1987, you know, that whole the whole the whole mandates, the new mandates that they put out, which has been hasn't been since 1987 and, and everybody celebrated that it it still hasn't changed and and the same as you know the cms put out an announcement last week about minimum staffing requirements and everybody was very excited about that except if you look closer again we are up against the same problems who's going to enforce it who's overseeing it and 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 you know who is incentivized to do that um no one <laughs> And I keep man, saying that if yeah. I don't understand why this country thinks it's OK to profit off of somebody being sick or needing care. It's like I get people don't want the government involved in our health care. That's a whole that is like an entire other show, not just our shows. But uh, yeah, it's but so they frustrating. Are. But they are. That's the thing. It, get the, they are 100 percent involved. Because when you get to when you get to anybody that's over 65 who's on Medicare and anybody who's, you know, make, taking getting use out of Medicaid, you're uh, you are working with the government. And that's the way it is. So government, what we are, you know, we are socialized in that respect. We are socialized. I mean, you you, you can call it whatever you want, but that's what it is. And mm -hmm. once. And so the government is there and the government is is what is the problem because CMS the Center for Medicare and Medicaid services are not are are responsible for allocating the funds that the federal government has mandated that we pay for out of our taxes that you pay your whole life for into into that right yep and and those that money is allocated by CMS and then CMS you know, 
just gets the bills and or, or doles it out, just checks off the boxes. There's no oversight. There's no transparency. It's it's really at its core. The whole business model is organized crime, but it's legal. <laughs> I it's love legal. that analogy. Yeah, I'm sure it is. It's legalized what? because there's no rules put in place. There are no rules. There's no transparency. And it's 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 the most it's it's the most lucrative business to be involved in. Yeah, I believe that. Do you think that the disconnect happens because our governmental leaders aren't ever going to have to deal with that kind of care? They've got the money and I mean, they have like a whole different health care system for them, sort of. Well, part maybe part of that i mean yes anybody who's in the in the the you know rarefied 1% in this country will fare okay right because yep. they'll be able to, so if if you know they'll be able to pay if you need care private care in your home you'd be able to afford four or five caregivers cuz sometimes that's what it takes mhm we had 24/7 caregivers for my parents when my dad was on hospice so this was the beginning of 2017 and it was over $700 a day. Yes. And we had, what do we have? Three, three times eight is 24, I believe. Like I said, math's also not my thing, <laughs> but yeah. And it, you know, and it was, it was very stressful because I couldn't monitor or manage people that were there at three o'clock in the morning. Like I'm solar charged. The sun goes down. I go down. <laughs> it's like. I'm not awake. at Well, I'm usually awake at three because I got to go to the bathroom, but then I go back to sleep. I'm not <laughs> driving 20 miles to my parents' house, make sure the caregiver isn't doing something they shouldn't be doing or they're doing what they need to do. You know, some of them were really great and didn't get paid enough. And some of them were adequate. And a couple of them, we had to tell the, the company not to send them back. Right, just, right. You know, and here my dad is dying and we're trying to deal with my mom who has advanced Alzheimer's and like the last thing I needed to deal with was caregivers. Like, well, that, yeah. And that's that. Let, let me tell you, that is the norm. Mm -hmm. That's the normal situation. And even with you having hospice in your home, you know, and when I talk about the 1%, I'm talking about private care, people that are not paying $700 a day. I'm talking about, you know, two to three to $5,000 a day care. Right. So, so if you can afford that, God bless you. Yeah. Most people can't. And so, you know, you asked why, why is this happening? Well, because the nursing home industry has a very strong lobby and their lobby is actually stronger than the pharmaceutical lobby. And Ooh, they, yeah, that's scary. It's very scary. And so they, they are, nobody is incentivized in our government to make changes. So that's why, you know, your typical advocacy doesn't work. All of this incredible energy that's gone towards, you know, making policy changes, speaking at, you know, Congress, going to rallies, all of these kinds of, you know, typical kinds of advocacy that normally works is is really an echo chamber and nobody is paying attention that needs to pay attention or it becomes lip service or or becomes, you know, performative policy making. Yeah, we don't need any of that. <laughs> no, but that's what it is. So and 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 then and then there's the big A word, which is ageism. And so we the public are culpable because we're not looking. And it's true. I'm 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 guilty too. And I have a mom that I adored and wanted the best for her. I didn't realize how ageist we are and how ableist we are and, you know, and on and on and on all the isms, right? It's true. And that really affects how we, how, how this industry is able to get away with what they're getting away with. So in essence, the foxes is, is put in charge of the hen house. I believe it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your mom? I know she was a singer. Yeah. Yes, she was. So my mom was a delightful human being. She was fun and and energetic and a force. And she started singing opera at nine. She was a protege. She was singing 
jazz at 16. She got signed to Capitol Records at 19. She decided she didn't want to go on the road with because everybody at the time, at least in the bands that she, you know, would would be traveling with. There was a lot of heroin and a lot of drug use. And my mom, that was not her gig. And she ended up marrying my dad. But, you know, and then my dad was a big force in the music industry. So, she, so they became a good team. And, um, you know, my mom had Alzheimer's almost as long as your mom, almost 17 years. And um, it was it it was a journey. It's a journey, as you know. It's a, a journey, very long journey, <laughs> a very long exit for me. It was, it was, it was bittersweet because I, we, I just loved her so much. We just had such a great relationship. And I thought um, this gave me the ramp to figure out how I was going to deal with her exiting this world. And so I took, I, for a long time, like when she was first diagnosed, like all of us, I was like, we're fixing this. We're going to, we'll be the first, but yeah, but we're getting this mom. Don't worry about it. We got this Alzheimer's getting its ass kicked tomorrow. Right. And then you realize like, you know, after about a year or so, you're like, this is exhausting and it isn't working. It's like nothing is working. It's not, I can't, I'm too weak. I can't do it. I, I, yeah, this beast is too strong. So what can I do? I, I decided, you know, I can't pull my mom into my world. I'm going to I'm going to live in her world when I'm with her and find the best way to make it happy for all of us and to Makes enjoy sense. yeah, and to enjoy whatever 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 cognitive level she was at like I did with my daughters as they were growing up. Like whatever level they were at, it was as, you know, infants, toddlers, you know, children, teenagers, teenagers <laughs> get, get into their mindset and, and be with, be where they're at. And so, you know, be the most empathetic you can be. And that, and, you know, like, why do you need those Converse shoes? Oh, because everybody else has them. Well, that makes sense. If I think about it when I'm 13, yeah, going to school and you're the only one that doesn't have it. It makes a difference, you know, and it sounds stupid as an adult. You're like, you don't need them. They're not that important. Da, da, yeah. da, you know? But then you have to get into their mindset. Where are they at in their development? Where it makes so much sense to like not stand out. Yeah. There's, you're going through so many other things. Why not mitigate as much stress as you can and co- and choose your battles? So that's what I did with mom was like, I decided, let me find out where she's at in every stage and then and mitigate the stress. And and concentrate on the joy that I could find with her. And there was so much because, you know, for us, my mom's cognitive reserve, like everybody has cognitive reserve. And I'm sure your your audience has heard of that, right? In terms mm-hmm. of Alzheimer's, you know, whether if you are an accountant and, you know, numbers are going to be your cognitive reserve, you're going to tell, you know, till you... To the wee ends of your of whatever's left of your brain cells, you're going to be like, oh yeah, that's seventy five. You know, you're <laughs> going to know what it is. My mom give her a song. You know, she she wouldn't know. You know, a hammer from a nail. Give her a song, and she's she remembers the words better than me. So we used music. That was our tool. Food. A lot of lovin's. My mom was very responsive to love because she was very, very demonstrative and affectionate and a huge flirt <laughs> and had game, way more game than I've ever had, even in a wheelchair and with advanced Alzheimer's. So, you know, there was that too. And so we just, you know, and and I learned I learned how to open up the window with her and get in. And I loved every bit of it. Like I loved every bit of raising my daughters. And and like you know, we become our mother's mother. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah, and- see, my mom liked talk TV and talk radio. And so trying to do all the music stuff, because you know, we always said, Oh, you could connect with them with music, but did not work with my mom. I should have just played her friggin' podcasts. But I was always afraid to play mine. And I didn't think she would connect with others and you know, way too much in my own head. So I know oh, your mom. What was that? Would have lo- I bet she would have loved your podcast, right? Probably. And it's not like I she talked loved about- a talk show, but she would have been like, my daughter's doing a talk show. She would have loved it. Possibly. She thought I, I was think- her best friend. So that also yeah. made things weird. But 
So I know your mom was in a private, a five-star private pay nursing home. Not private paid. Oh, not private paid. It could be, it could be private paid. It, it, but when you get to a certain point, like, as you know, very long disease, most people that have the long-term Alzheimer's will run out of, oh, I'm so sorry, will run out of, <laughs> I should know better, should run out of money. They do. I'll say that again. Most people that have long-term Alzheimer's will deplete their savings at some point. So my th- this p- specific, this particular facility at some point does take Medicaid and Medicare. So like most people, at, at, if you live a certain age, that's, that's what you're looking at in long-term care. So that's where she was at. Now, I mean, it's too to say that that facilities aren't making enough money from Medicare and Medicaid is is a complete misnomer. That's a that's a lie. They're making plenty of money. They're making enough money to take care of their their residents and also to pay their staff, which they don't do. And they underpay and understaff and that's how they make Buco's money. Yep. My mom was in a private pay um memory community. And most of the staff, so there's, I was really close to about four or five of the caregivers, the ones that were on shift when I was there. Two of them worked at Starbucks for eight hours before going to the memory care and working for eight hours. I don't know how you dealt with people for eight hours with cognitive problems, but after dealing with the ding dongs at Starbucks, (laughs) no, thank you. And then the one gal that was really in charge of my mom a lot. She just did caregiving and she had zero money because when after my mom passed away, well, we moved before my mom passed away and she would she had commented on, oh, she would have loved it if I could have like given her some of this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what you want. <laughs> I was like, it was kind of a really awkward statement because I'm I would have totally given her anything that she could have used, but I didn't know that she had that kind of need. So yeah, it was. They were not paid enough. And I don't think the executive director was either because he, you know, dressed basic and drove an older Honda Accord. So if he was getting paid some big bucks, he certainly wasn't wearing it or driving it. So I'm pretty certain he wasn't making the kind of money he needed to deal with all the nonsense he had to deal with. So somebody is making the money somewhere. It was a good community. Mom had great care. My listeners know that they said my mom could keep her dog and I did not do any legal searches or Google searches or any kind of logical investigations. I just basically flung a money at them. Just like, okay, fine. She can keep that damn dog. <laughs> Here you go. Here's a deposit. So I was really lucky it worked out so well, but it didn't work out the same for your mom. Well, yeah. And, and, and everyone's experience is different and I'll, and I'm going to, I want to say, I'll, let me, let me, let me preface this by saying, are there good places? Yes, there's good places. Are there great front, you know, frontline providers, CNAs in particular, they're the ones that are do the hands-on every day. Um, of course, of course, but those, those really good facilities are few and far between, and they don't, they don't mitigate the other ones. They don't take away the bad ones, which there are way more. Mm-hmm. That is the norm. That is the average. And it's not me just spouting because, you know, my mom's situation, I've been in the trenches in this, you know, doing my research and my reconnaissance and my partner, Rick Moncastle, you know, the honorable uh, former attorney, U.S. attorney, assistant mm-hmm. attorney general who took, who was, you know, investigated and prosecuted. Purdue Pharma, Abbott Labs, um, and then also investigated and prosecuted federally nursing homes for the past 25 years. And the end result was if they got fined, it's cost of doing business and nothing changes. And that's why he's working with me on this project because he wants to see it change. It's been this way too long and people are suffering. It's not just, oh my gosh, they're, you know, they need a better pillow or, you know, they're not getting enough attention or whatever the hell it is. I mean, people are suffering. They are being warehoused, mm-hmm. warehoused and, and, and given they're either not given enough treatment because Medicare doesn't cover it or Medi-Cal or Medicaid, 
or they're given things they don't need because they can bill that, which is just as bad. And so it is, it is egregious, it is torturous, and, and it has to stop. It has to stop because it's not my mom's story, just it's everybody's story. What's your story, my story? And, you know, and it's only going to get worse because population is more and the infrastructure is not there. That's for sure. Especially after COVID, it's like the, I was surprised how many, so my mom passed away March 31st, 2020. They asked me to come back and clean out her room in May. So like two months later, and then I went back in October and just the changes in that six ish, you know, eight ish months was interesting. I was surprised at the ones that were still there and happy. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I was happy they were still there. I don't know if that was good or bad, but it was just, it felt different. It was, yeah. and, you know, they just, it was, I don't know. It just, maybe because I hadn't been there for so long, but it just, it felt very strange. And I know that, you know, we had a caregiver shortage before the pandemic. Now it's substantially worse. It's insane. Well, it's insane. Well, COVID did, did a, it did us a service in that it pulled the curtain back on what was happening. Mm-hmm. And, and it couldn't, unless, unless you have your head in the sand, which a lot of us do. And I don't mean that derogatorily, but we're busy with our lives. You know, if you're in the middle of your life and, and it, you know, <laughs> nursing homes are not a sexy subject, you know, no. right. But, but, you know, it, the truth is, is that it, it it is it is not just the nursing home industry. It's also our our hospitals and our our healthcare industry in general. You know, there's so there's big business, big corporations are taking over every part mm-hmm. of the healthcare system, and so you're going to see a lot of you know geriatricians are are a rarity now. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I talked to one, she actually is like quasi related to a friend of the family. It's kind of like, really strange show up at a birthday party. I'm like, Oh, Hey, your episode's coming out since such a time. It was very strange, but yeah, she told me, so this was like, say um, a year and a half ago, maybe that there was 3,500 geriatricians in the United States and they're the lowest paid um, specialty, which makes no sense. Like, you know, it's not easy taking care of an older adult, especially if they've got a cognitive disease, because not only do are you taking care of this, you know, aging adult, but you also have to deal with their family. It's not like yeah. they can just walk themselves into the doctor and say, hey, I'm experiencing da da da. You basically have at least two patients to deal with. Exactly. And- exactly. And and the and the amount of geriatricians has gone in- incredibly, you know, it's it's just gonna it's so rare. And like you said, they're the they're the lowest paid, so there aren't a lot of people, you, you know, able to go into that direction. So what does that do for us? So that what it does is that nobody really understands this this focus of health, and and people are guessing at best, and that's why people are you know getting drugs that they shouldn't be getting, black box drugs that that because people don't understand. That's why when you take somebody who is a senior citizen into 
an emergency ER situation, you know, that what is normal for them, what is their base would not be our base and right. and they're being treated. They're being, you know, it's one size fits all and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah, You think they'd learn in medical school that everybody's different. <laughs> right. It's right. like day one, right? <laughs> right. And then there's ageism again. I'm going to keep going back to ageism because, you know, uh, so many of the, of the ER uh, doctors and nurses and, and hospital um, providers that I've talked to, it's like, they, they admitted, they said, we're guilty of it. We say, oh, well, they're 89. They'll wait. And it's so unfair because, you know, I kept saying when I was, when I was caring for my mom last year during this whole tragedy that was happening, I said, you know, I had the hospice doctor tell me your mom's 89. And I was like, you know what, when you're 89, Let's let, you know, tell me how you feel right now. My mom's enjoying her life or she was. Who are you? Nobody has the right to tell anybody whether it's whether they should live or die. You have that's your that's your human right. Well, they don't know. Are you going to live to 90 or are you going to be like my paternal grandmother and live to 103? I mean, that's a let's see if I can do the math. That's 11 at 13. Three. Years. Yeah. 13 yeah. years. That's a pretty sizable chunk of time. That's a, that's a terrific chunk of time. And, you know, and, and it's valuable. It's valuable to the family. It's valuable to the, to the person, to the resident, to the patient. And, and it just, you know, it doesn't, that is the ages and that is the judgment, you know, that we place upon people that are older because we're all, we're all terminal. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, how, you know, how are we putting a worth on, how are we judging that worth of, you know, let's say you get to 50, are you less worthy than someone at 40, 60? Are you less, you know, is that, is that how we're looking at life? Because I, I frankly feel like, and I've always felt this way that the older we get, God willing, that we, we have, we've aggregated so much more experience and, and knowledge that, that we have to share. It's invaluable. And, and, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I really appreciate the experience and the, and the intelligence that I have now than I did. You know, I, I, I am, I'm very proud of it. And I'm very, proud of the of the transformations that that I've been able to make but that takes time that's true and you don't want to be acting like a 30 year old when you're 60 because that just seems kind of cringy well I don't even think about that to be honest with you Jennifer like I don't even like to frame it like that like I I feel like I'll always be 30 in my head and I know I do and it's not like it's not like I'm trying to be that it's where I it's my vitality it's who I am Okay. And I don't feel like I need to adjust that to some, some created box. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, you can't like, you know, I dance hip hop and I, as you know, and, and I, I, I'm twice as old as some people and some people are older than me. Right. And who are professional dancers. And I don't think we should box ourselves into, you know, some, some social construct that doesn't really make sense because I am sure that everybody listening knows somebody at 20 who was acting like 60 (laughs) and someone at six. Right. And I, Mm -hmm. that that used to annoy me. Like I remember when I first got out of college and my best friends were like, Oh, we're old now. And like, no, no, no. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't even (laughs) want to think about it. I I don't even think that way. Like I, you know, I had friends who were 60 in my twenties who were just as cool as any 20 year old friend I had. Right. And like one of my best friends is in her late seventies and I adore her and she's as she's more vital than some of my friends in their fifties, you know? And so I, I don't look at it that way. I look at it like, how do you feel? How do Mm -hmm. you present? You know, I've, I've, and I don't, I more power to you. Listen, if I was, um, uh, it all depends. I don't know. How do I say this? Like without sounding goofy, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I dress like a 25 year old, a 30 year old, whatever. It doesn't matter. I mean, if you're going to identify it, I'm not going to walk around with, 
you know, midriffs, unless my abs were looking really good that day. <laughs> but but who cares? True. Who cares? Do you feel good? Do you feel good? Do you look good? You know, I, I feel like, I mean, I feel like if if you feel good about yourself and you are working it, go work it, girl. Work that, work whatever you want to work. Well, I think we're at the start of a cultural change to where people are like, you know, this country's aging and old people or older people have wisdom. And I mean, I think old some older people that were cool in their 20s are like way more cool in their 60s and 70s because it's like it's had time to like mature or what's, you know, I'm thinking like aged wine, which is funny because I don't even drink. But, you know, it's like yeah. certain things are just better with age, you know, like even 100%. leftovers. So um uh, what is it that what what is it that you've discovered with your movie that you think can help people like I don't know if we can avoid some of these problems but how do well, we help shift this baloney into something better cuz you know like if I'm going to live for another 46 years I would prefer that you know the healthcare is better and you know assisted living communities and memory care communities are better cuz I plan on living in assisted living at 85 because I'm not dealing with cleaning the house and that crap when I'm 85. Right. Well, I mean, listen, I think that that the the structure of the of that, of all of of, of elder care and, and assisted living and and those kinds of, of facilities are it's 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 not healthy. And so it needs to be re- rethought about. It re- needs to be rethought because, yeah, I get it. You don't want to be doing all that stuff. You know, let's say that's your goal. So but but you want to live somewhere where where you're thriving, not surviving. Mm-hmm. Right. You want to yep. thrive. You want to be in a community. Community is everything and community, you know, and that takes a different kind of structure. And so right now it's about keeping people alive, like I said, surviving. That's not living. That's not quality of life. We need uh, we need situations that keep us engaged, right? Mm-hmm. Purpose with purpose, and, and those are the things that bring quality to life. So you know, what's the point of living of living an extended amount of years if they're shitty? Yeah, well, they're, the, where the I, assisted the assisted living community that mom's memory care was attached to was pretty vibrant. I mean, okay. So 85, that's like a little less than 20 years. I might change my mind in 20 years. Who knows? Actually, no, it is about 20 years. Um, see, I told you I can do math. There you go. Good girl. No, it's 30 years. Thank you. I'm thinking, geez, that sounds awfully close. <laughs> it would be 29 years. I can, I can do math when I need to. Um, there was a gal there who was a volunteer. She was like the kind of the helper. She's like a community advocate. So she kind of helped put the activities together. My mom was giving me a real fuss one day, wouldn't talk to me and it got ugly. And she walked my mom out to the car because I would pick my mom up at memory care, drive around the building. And we'd go to lunch in the assisted living dining room because it was very nice. And it had, you know, nice portion controlled meals. And then I would take her back around. So it was like an extended excursion to her and it was easier for me but this one day she was just having a really terrible day and she was really taking it out on me and this older woman dealt with my mother and to some extent me but I just went and got in the car I was just like I'm just gonna let her handle this so there was there was a lot more stuff going on there was a middle school across the street they would come over and engage with the older adults which I thought was fantastic so that was great obviously my perspective on assisted living is skewed very positively because this particular community was pretty good. That's awesome. And that maybe that's a good model then whatever goes on there. And there's all kinds of models that we're going to, you know, include in in this documentary. It's not all doom and gloom. I mean, basically it's, you know, I'm going to describe what happens using my mom's story. And then why does it, how does it happen? Why does it happen? And then how do we fix it? Right. And it and the shift that you you know mentioned a couple minutes ago is is really a, a it it has to be a collective shift and a and a collective conscious conscious shift in our in our public. The public really needs to see this. So this this film is really about educating everybody as to what's really going on, because it 
if you knew it's almost like it's almost like you know our food industry if you knew and i you know i'm not a staunch vegan but if it's hard to look at i get it i get it but if we don't we're culpable mhm we don't look at it when i when it's like i say i'm doing this film because i saw things i can't unsee so if you know if you know then you can do better so I want people to know, and then we can do better because we can, we can do better, but we can't if we don't do anything about it, but we need, we need to know. And, and I, that's the purpose of the film is to, is to let people know what is really happening and, and not if this isn't like a sensational, I'm not trying to, to be sensationalistic or, or try to, you know, uh, that's not me. I live in happy zone. I'm, I'm, de- yeah. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't want to know this. I didn't want to know this guys. I did not want to know this. This is not what I wanted to know. We need those memories extracted. Yeah. We, we know you live in happy, happy world. Cause you're in Hollywood, <laughs> but I really am the epitome of, of, you know, I am, I am just really want to, I don't want to know the bad parts, but you know, I also am very responsible and when I saw what my mom went through it, you know, when you see the film, hopefully you will see how, how egregious and how callous a lot of our, our system has gotten to the point where, you know, I got to the point where it was like, and I did not want my mom to die. I was like, what are we doing? Let's kill her. Hmm. Let's kill her. This is not living. Like, what are we doing, folks? Do you want to ex- do you want to explain what happened? Sure. I mean, you know, COVID really, like I said earlier, pulled the curtain back and really, you know, it, it, it exaggerated or, you know, exasperated what was happening behind the scenes before, which was the understaffing and the and the lack of of hiring staff and then actual the good staff. And when I say good staff, I'm not being judgmental. I'm saying staff that really wants to be there Mm -hmm. and then educate, and then also educating that staff. So they weren't paying for educating education and they weren't, and they're not paying them enough to, to want to be there. And the vocational CNAs and, and LVNs and, and RNs at a lesser extent, you know, are just overworked. They just can't handle the the amount, and so it 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 is the norm that people are they're they're abused and neglected because they can't help it. So my mother ended up, you know, going into the hospital without me ever knowing that she even had this with a with a level three and a half to four uh, pressure wound in her sacrum. Ooh. It should never get past one if you're doing your job. Everybody can get a, anybody can get a bed sore, but you, but if you're being well cared for, and my mom wasn't bedridden, she was in a wheelchair. You should, you know, that, that, that should be nipped in the bud immediately. Get getting to a stage three or four. And if you don't know what a, a bed sore is, like I didn't, <laughs> I thought it was a bruise. I thought it was like, you know, you lean on your elbow too long and ow, it's red and it hurts. Now this, these things burrow into down to the bone. Yeah, they're like open wounds. Open wounds. My mom's got to be this big. So which was about eight inches. Oh, that's awful. With with and that causes sepsis. Mm-hmm. And that causes dehydration. And then, you know, and then they're not being hydrated well and they're not being, you know, fed well. And uh, and they're not being turned or moved. And if they're in a wheelchair, they're left in their incontinent, they're left in their urine or their feces, and there's not enough people. The people that are bedridden, if they have to go to the bathroom, there's not enough people. And you'll hear a CNA go, just go in your bed. I can't deal with you now. Mm. And the, first of all, the, it's unhealthy. Second of all, can you imagine the indignity of it? Well, yeah, it's like just on the flip side of the coin, it's not going to take less time to clean up the person and the bed and their clothing versus getting them out of the bed, which I know for a lot of them require a Hoyer lift and putting them in the wheelchair, then transferred into the toilet. Yeah. That's a lot of physical work, mm-hmm. but it's not, 
it's not going to be less work. No, and but I would they think don't it's have less the time. They just yeah. don't have the time, and and that's why people lay in their own excrements for hours, eight to 12, ten hours at a time. You're going to get scabies from that. You're going to get bed sores. You're going to be very, very ill. And you get that, and then you get pneumonia, and then so on and so forth. So when my mom went into the hospital during COVID time, you know, it was right at it was Omicron. It was last January, and you couldn't get in the hospitals. We couldn't get in the hospitals. That's another problem. That's another problem that you know that that this whole performative uh, regulation during crisis time that we that a family member couldn't get into a hospital. Why not give us the same PPE that they're giving everybody else? We're yeah. as important as anybody else. Anyway, they ended up intubating my mother three times, Oof. giving her a G-tube, which she absolutely didn't need, but that made it easier for them. And, and, and deeming her NPO, which means nothing by mouth, again, not necessary. Saying that she possibly was aspirating, no, she wasn't, you know, and so on and so on and so on. So by the, t- you know, and when she went back to her, her facility, I kept begging them to take that G tube out. My mom wanted to eat. That was her life. What else do you have? Yeah, for real. <laughs> I love food. <laughs> what else do you have? Anyway, it, it was torture for six till she died in July. She had no solid food. And I, the only, they finally, without a, without a uh, swallow evaluation, just deemed that she was aspirating. And I said, and, and, you know, that, it, 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 this is a slippery slope if I start the story because, you know, having a G tube can cause aspiration far, far more, you know, than than having a sip of water or juice or some, you know, soft food. Without I did you not know that. Oh yeah, there's nothing healthy about a G tube. That is your last resort. Nobody needs to be on a G tube unless you're in a in a coma and there's a possibility that you're going to come out of it. They're also very uncomfortable from what I understand. They're terrible. They're terrible. She had that on top of a wound that they decided that they weren't going to really, they'll just keep it clean because she's going to succumb to it. Well, she's going to succumb to it because you're not calling in a wound specialist that she needs. And so would you succumb to it? And so would I, and so would you, Jennifer, if no one took care of it. And by the way, it's not an old person's disease. Any of us can get that. Mm -hmm. If you're laying too long in one spot. So these are the things that are happening because they're dismissing and they can, they can still bill and get paid for that. So, and by the way, once one, when your loved one, if they're on, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, and you go into hospice, you know, that needs to be revamped too, because hospice is basically, it gives them free for all to say, well, we don't need to do anything because they're dying. Let's just keep them comfortable. Well, some people are in hospice for six months, a year. Um, yeah. that, that's quality time. And basically they're keeping them sedated until they die. And then, and making my, you know, they can bill up to $1,500 a day. That's $30,000 a month. Ooh, that's a lot. So that's a, in in facility hospice. That's right. That's okay. right. Where my, my only ho- my only hospice experiences have been them coming to the home for my grandparents and for my dad and the, to a small extent my mom. Although again, that was right at the height of what the hell is this COVID thing? <laughs> so um, they were better than nothing, but you know, it the world was falling apart at that time. So I don't fault them. They didn't do what they said they were going to do to the extent, but they were there and they were, they helped, they helped me. So I'll I'll tell you that whether it was COVID or not, that's the same experience you would have had. The one with my dad was good. They were really good because he was a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, And then I just think the problem with the, the company that worked for my mom because they worked closely with the community she lived in. I think it was just, I mean, my mom fell and broke her leg March 8th, 2020 and passed away March 31st. So that interim in that, you know, that three weeks, 
was literally the, you know, we went from, oh, this seems to be a problem in China to holy shit, it's here to holy crap, what the hell is going on to lockdowns? I mean, like in three weeks, our whole world went upside down and, you know, there was probably a lot more people needing hospice than they, it was probably the same thing, lack of staffing, lack of available people. So they were there. They just, they didn't show up as many days a week as they said they were going to. And they didn't provide as many services, but she also didn't necessarily need them. So, you know, but I couldn't see her for two weeks. So it was like, I'm making judgments based on how often I talk to them. Cause I didn't, I think I saw the hospice nurse twice. I did get to see my mom before she passed away, but not only the day before. It was was crazy times. So tell me real quick. I know your shows have a tendency to go longer than mine. And I'm trying to keep mine under an hour. I get it. I get it. Um, so when did you start filming the documentary? Well, we started, I started pretty, pretty close to after my mom passed away because, um, I, I realized I had, I had taken a lot of video and cause that's just cause I'm a filmmaker and I just took a lot of for, for posterity. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I thought I really need to tell this story, and I'm that's that's my gift is is as a storyteller. So let me tell my mom's story, which I thought was poetic because she went into the hospital on January seventeenth, twenty twenty two, and died on July seventeenth, six months later, twenty twenty two. And I thought it was, a, and it was a very big, it was a it was a a huge journey for me emotionally, and you know, uh, ed, 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 educationally as well. And and for my mother, it was it was a very beautiful, albeit torturous journey. But I said to my mom the night before she died, "You taught me how to live, and now you're teaching me how to die." And that was and that was the gift that she left me. And um, so I want to honor this crap that she went through by paying it forward to everybody. And um, so I started last year. I have over seventy five interviews with experts from. Every every sanction of this industry from policymakers, advocates who have been doing this, you know, the the most respected in their, uh, you know, voices in this country, as well as caregivers and residents and providers, doctors, everybody. And and really telling the story as honestly and as openly as we can. And before you cut me off, we're still raising <laughs> money. We're, we're our fiscal sponsor is um, the amazing organization, the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long Term Care. They started in 1975. Ralph Nader, you know, and they've been working at this. So that tells you how long this advocacy yeah. has been going on. They are our fiscal sponsor. We are we are continuing to raise money. We're in the we are in the editing phase, which is the hardest, and it is going extremely well. I'm really proud of this project. We do need more funds to finish, and it's all tax deductible. Um, and we are on GoFundMe, and where you have, and you can go either to our GoFundMe or to the National Consumer Voice has a, a dedicated page to us, and and part of our whatever we raise goes to the National Consumer Voice as well, whether you go to GoFundMe or uh, or there directly, and um, and we really appreciate anything like you know if you can if it's five dollars that's great it's you know we just want to get this done before the end of the year and it's a beast of a job yeah so is there a better link the the gofundme or the national the other one you said national consumer voice i i'll i'll, I'll provide that for you with all okay the, and you can put it in the show notes oh definitely yes that's the whole point yeah. um, i just want to make sure that whichever link we give you or we I give out is the one that's going to give you the most money. Cause I know GoFundMe takes their fee, which is totally You are fine. so smart. That is so correct. <laughs> that is so well, correct. Well, if you, so if, 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 you know, whatever's easier for your audience, but yes, you are right. GoFundMe does take a little, uh, takes their little portion and, and it does, it does dig into it. So if you go directly to the national consumer voice, I'll give you both links. Okay. You can, it'll more of us, more of it will go, end up in our pockets and you know, that would be great. So thank you. You're welcome. And once it's done, how is it going to be distributed or is that to be determined once you get done? It is TBD, but but we do already have a lot of interest from several distributors who have already, you know, 
heard of the project and are very interested and find it very worthy. And um, so we're, we're, we feel very fortunate about that. And we're pro- you know, probably do what I did with my other film is, is also presented through the, the festival circuit as well. But it, you know, it will be widely distributed and it'll be, you know, a tool for a tool for everybody. It'll be an educational tool, really. So, um, but it's really not going to be dry, you guys. It's going to, it's a story. It's a love story. It's a love story. And it's not just my love story. There's going to be a lot of love stories in there. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to humanize this and make it really, you know, resonate for everybody. So we're not just talking about data. It's not just, (laughs) and I'm not just, you know, and I'm not trying to, to really, you know, put, I'm not trying to, what is the, you're not trying to blow up the industry, just. Well, no, I want to blow up the industry. Don't get me wrong. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to vilify anybody in particular or any, you know, there are really good, good, good actors out there and good facilities and really, you know, vocational caregivers that really, really care. And, you know, they're, they are experiencing moral injury because they have to work within this business model. That's not fair to them either. Nope. The whole thing has to change. (laughs) The whole thing has to change. So just know that, you know, this is, this is really about change and movement. That's all. And that, and that's what I want to see happen. And, you know, cause just, just blaming the blame game doesn't do anything. Mm-mm. It that gets people digging their heels and it, it's actually a, it's counterintuitive to getting change made. Well, this, really is ter- really- this is terrific. I'm sorry your mom had to go through it, but I yeah. guess what you said, she taught you how to die and she, she gave you this movie to produce for all of us to hopefully make this change. And so I hope people can chip in a couple dollars here and there and get this done. Cause I think we all need to see it. Um, especially for those of us that plan on living another 46 years. Right. Uh, yeah. That's hey, right. maybe, maybe uh, 48, if not eight, four, yeah. 48. If I want to go to 105, Lordy, that seems oh, like a long time. <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, you know, but hey, what, gotta have goals. Gotta have goals. <laughs> I still got a, a heck of a lot to do, right? Yeah, Come me on. too. I'm behind, man. Too many places to go, things to see, more things to learn. So this has That's been right. terrific. No, and thanks. I wish you the best of luck on everything. And one of these days we'll get together. We tried when I was, we threatened when I was in Southern California some other time. But we'll manage. We'll do it. We'll do We're not it. that far apart. We're not that far apart, my Cali sister. Yeah. Right. Thank you again. Thank you for supporting. And um, and I, I'll, I'll see you on social media like we do. Yeah, for real. Thanks so much. <laughs>